Welcome back. We are at the end of our focus week on spaying and neutering our pets. Hopefully you've been tuned in throughout the week to learn a lot about the different options for sterilizing our pets, uh, both cats and dogs, and reasons why you may have wanted to leave them intact, uh, particularly with the dogs. If you saw our uh, live presentation on the kitty cats last night with the two crazy cat ladies, we learned lots and lots and lots about kitty cats. Um, and I'm sorry, my internet flipped out for a couple minutes near the end of the video, but it did come back on. So if you tuned out when the video went out, uh, go back and look at the end because we did, we were able to finish. Um, but we, we know that kitty cats are not small dogs and that cats, um, their endocrine systems are not as affected by spay and neuter as our dogs are. Um, and that partly is because we don't have as much adrenal gland disease in general with kitty cats. We don't see Cushing's disease. We don't see um, Addison's disease. And we don't see hypothyroidism in cats. We see hyperthyroidism. So, and then when we were talking about the female kitty cats, we talked about the fact that their chances of having mammary cancer and particularly aggressive malignant mammary cancer are much higher than the dogs. So the cats are really a different um, beast than the dogs are when it comes to this discussion. So, but there are things that we can, uh, we can do to support our pets that have been spayed and neutered. So I want to talk about things that you can do to prep your pet for surgery if they're going in to be spayed or neutered at whatever age you've decided to have that done. And I also want to talk about things that you can do to support those pets who already have been spayed or neutered. Um, and now you're concerned, uh, particularly if it was a pediatric spay or neuter, that you didn't have any options because you adopted or a rescue group or a shelter said this is the way it had to be done. We understand that. We know that that happens. We know the reasons why it happens. Um, we don't think that it is ideal for dogs or for cats to have pediatric spay and neuter, but I am sympathetic to the rescue organizations and the shelters and humane societies that can be overwhelmed, particularly coming up on spring. We're coming up on kitten season, and this is when the shelters just really get overwhelmed. So I understand it. Um, but let's talk about um, things that we can do to support our pets. Um, for one thing, if you are, have your pet scheduled or you're thinking about getting them scheduled to go in for that spay or neuter, you don't want to have any vaccinations given within two weeks of the surgery. So if your veterinarian is saying, oh, they have to be up to date on vaccines or they have to have a rabies vaccine or whatever it is that they're insisting on, try to talk them out of it anyway, but whatever they're insisting on, make sure that you get that done at least two weeks prior to the surgery because when we give a vaccine, the immune system has to react to that. It, it's actually an active process and it also can increase bleeding tendencies if a vaccine is given too close to a surgical procedure. So we don't wanna give any vaccines within two weeks and absolutely no vaccines should be given on the day of surgery. So if they're saying, oh, while, while he or she is here, we're gonna update everything and we'll give them the 57 vaccines that we think they need, which they don't, but um, do not allow it to happen on the day of surgery. So if they have requirements that they have to have something in order to have surgery, giving it the day of surgery isn't going to protect them that day anyway. So get it done way ahead of time. Okay. Um, definitely before surgery, have a pre-op exam, complete exam, not just a quick flyby, you know, looks good. Got two, two testicles. Great. We're good to go. Make sure they listen to the heart, both sides of the chest over all four areas where the valves are. Listen to the lungs really well. Get pre-op lab work. Do not skimp on this. It can be done the same day as surgery, but make sure the lab work's done prior to the surgery, that they don't put them under and then do the lab work. Get the lab work done. Get your results. Make sure, because it is amazing how many times we do pre-op lab work and we go, oh my gosh, we think this pet might have a liver shunt or this pet has kidney disease and has a congenital problem that we didn't know about. So you want to know that prior to giving them an anesthetic. Um, 
If you have a middle-aged or older dog who is going to be having surgery, I would recommend also checking their thyroid and um, consider getting a chest x-ray as well to make sure that everything is okay there. And particularly if they hear a murmur or something like that on the exam, let's get an x-ray. Let's see if there's any heart enlargement, see what's going on there. Um, we want to support the immune system going into surgery. So I would start some of these things prior to going through surgery. Um, so we want a really good probiotic. And we just picked out Love Bugs because um, Love Bugs is, this is made by Adored Beast and it's for Instagram. Uh, it's made by Adored Beast and this one is good for dogs or cats. So really good if you don't have them on a probiotic already, then go ahead and start them on something a couple of weeks before surgery. Um, I really love using medicinal mushrooms as a way to strengthen the immune system. So one that you could use, we could um, pick specific mushrooms, but I really like the five defenders, which is a combination of five different mushrooms. It's got the reishi, maitake, shiitake, chaga, turkey tail. Um, so starting that a couple of weeks before surgery would be a good idea. And I would probably use these things for immune support for a couple of weeks after surgery as well. We want to keep their immune system functioning its best for healing. Um, you could also add on uh, vitamin C. So for instance, the RX vitamins, bio C, the directions, it's a half scoop per 10 pounds of body weight twice a day. So that's right on there. Um, so we might want to start that a couple of weeks before surgery and continue afterwards. Um, all right. So after surgery, uh, you're definitely going to be limiting activity, which your veterinarian should give you a sheet, which usually the technician will go over the post-op care with you, but limit activity. So leash walking, I can't tell you how many times people would take their dogs home, turn them loose in the backyard right after surgery, and they would tear across the yard or chase another dog or chase a squirrel and back in the office or at the ER with everything torn apart. So definitely be careful with them. Even if you have a calm, quiet animal, take precautions. Don't risk it. Don't just open the door and let them out in the backyard right after you get home. Um, you want to check the incision every day. Um, so spay incision, neuter incision, whatever, check it every day. Look for redness, look for swelling, look for any signs that your dog's been rubbing it or licking it. Um, some dogs may be sent home with an e-collar. Uh, they may be sent home with a surgical body suit, which I really like those. Um, Suticles is uh, the brand that we used to use. Uh, those are really nice. They're, you can also use baby onesies if you have a small animal, cut a hole for the tail. Um, but something like that. So you should be prepared ahead of time, ha figure out how you're going to keep them away from the incision, but still make sure you check it every day because those guys can be really tricky about getting in there to lick things. And sometimes they'll do silly things like they'll lay on the carpet and rub. So you've got a, an e-collar on and you think it's safe and you look over and there goes your dog doing the belly army crawl across the carpet trying to scratch the incision. So make sure you're checking it. Um, Dr. Peter DeBias recommends using Calendula 200C, which is a homeopathic option. Uh, one dose a day for five days um, says it has a positive effect on incision healing. If your veterinarian gives you the option to have um, cold laser over the incision area at the time of, of um, when they finish surgery, I would highly recommend taking that option. It does speed healing. It does decrease pain. And so anything natural that we can do to limit the amount of medications that we're going to have to throw on board be a really good idea. So if they do have cold laser and they offer that option, definitely go for it. It might add a few dollars on, but it's totally worth it. Um, so pain management, usually your veterinarian is going to send home some sort of non-steroidal anti-inflammatory. There's a million different names. For kitty cats, it's almost always, always on CR, which is given for like three days. Um, and for the dogs, it can be anything. Not all animals are going to need that drug level. Um, so you really have to monitor your pet's pain and know your animal and know what's going on with them. But there are things, natural products that you could try uh, that we've had really good success with. 
Um, you could have the cold laser, you could have acupuncture done at the time of surgery, which can uh, help decrease pain. You can use a natural product like DGP or dog on pain. Um, this is one tablet per 30 pounds of body weight once a day. So really easy to give. Um, and it is okay for dogs or cats. So for a small kitty cat, you might only be using a quarter or a half a tablet once a day. So it's pretty easy. It is chicken flavored. Not all of them like it, but um, is something that you can use for pain. And you could um, put it in a pill crusher and make it into a powder and mix it in with something that tastes good. Um, Arnica uh, can be used post-op as well. Um, Arnica is a homeopathic pain remedy. So we like that as well. You could combine DGP and Arnica. Um, really all of these things could be combined. We don't recommend long-term administration of DGP and an NSAID, but short-term you would be fine. Um, and if your pet is on an NSAID sent home with something, watch the stool. If they have vomiting, diarrhea, mucus in the stool, blood in the stool, black tarry stools, stop the NSAID immediately, call your veterinary office. Um, the biggest side effect with non-steroidal anti-inflammatories is gastric ulceration, and you do not want to risk a perforated bowel. So if there's any symptoms of GI distress, stop it immediately. Call your veterinary office. Um, do not give any over-the-counter pain medications. One Tylenol will kill your cat. Um, dogs don't do great with Tylenol either. I never recommended it. Um, things like naproxen, ibuprofen can be very deadly. Uh, cause liver failure, kidney failure, GI ulceration. So never, ever, ever give any over-the-counter medications, no aspirin, particularly if they're sent home with an NSAID, you do not want to commingle things. You will kill your animal. So don't be that person. Um, so we also want to detox the liver and kidneys from the effects of anesthesia. Um, so for the liver, we love uh, milk thistle. It's one of the best ways to detox. And there's a couple different products that we can use for that. So um, Solutions has a milk thistle product that's a powder, um, and then which is just organic milk thistle. And then we have the Adored Beast Liver Tonic. Um, and the Liver Tonic has a few other things in them. It has dandelion root, uh, it has the milk thistle, Burberry, uh, Celandine. Um, so we've got a few other things in that one. So it's really a matter of, do you want to get a powder in? Do you want to get a liquid in? Which is easier for you and for your pet. Um, so that we're going to do that for the liver. Um, also for the liver, we can use N-acetylcysteine, NAC. Um, we can use SAM-E. So all of these things, we're going to give them for one to two weeks post-op to help the liver clear the anesthesia because it has a lot of work to do. Um, and I love to add on CoQ10. It's an antioxidant, so that's going to be protective for the heart. It's going to be protective for the kidneys um, and helps with healing. So I like adding that. My dogs take that every day anyway. Um, foods with sulforane, things like uh, broccoli, Brussels sprouts, kale, uh, broccoli sprouts, um, really good for helping drain the liver. You know me uh, from a TCVM perspective. Uh, dark leafy greens are very good for the liver. You can also make like a parsley tea and add that to their food. Uh, if you want the easy way out, you get uh, green jujus, just greens, add a little water to that. And it's got all those things in there for you. It has celery and kale and dandelion greens and parsley, turmeric, nettles. So it's got all kinds of good things. That's an easy way to do it. Um, Okay, and then um, we want to detox the kidneys. Now, things like the dandelion that's in here, um, the nettles, those are going to help, and the CoQ10, those are going to help the kidneys. But you also, for a couple of weeks, could add an herbal formula like the Dr. Harvey's Kidney Health, um, which is a blend of herbs that's going to help. Uh, and that actually has some mushrooms in it as well. Um, so that's just another option. All right. Now... Doesn't matter when your pet was spayed or neutered, whether you're having it done now, whether it was done four or five years ago, we have disrupted the endocrine system. And so we took away a major source of hormones. So the estrogen hormones, estradiol, we took away the androgens um, for the males. And so the organ that takes over pretty much 
is the adrenal gland and the adrenal works in close conjunction with the pituitary gland. So it would be awesome to find a glandular support and we do not currently have a product. Uh, we've been searching and haven't found one that kind of is up to our level of standards right at the moment. We had one and then the company was having a really hard time supplying it to us. So, um, but other things that you can do, melatonin is actually a hormone that is produced by the pineal gland. Um, and melatonin promotes healthy cortisol and estrogen levels. So you could start your um, dog in particular, this is not as big a cat deal, uh, on melatonin. And usually we give about three milligrams per 40 pounds of body weight. Um, once or twice a day, but definitely at bedtime. So that can be very helpful. And some endocrinologists are now uh, recommending that we add HMR lignans as well, which uh, the melatonin and lignans are things that are used very commonly in dogs that are diagnosed with Cushing's disease. So this way we're helping support um, even function of those glands. Um, for those of you who have particularly large dogs, but really any size dog, who is spayed or neutered at middle age or later, there's a really good chance they are going to develop autoimmune thyroiditis in six to 12 months after spay or neuter. So please, please, please check thyroid levels on your dogs every six months if they have a late spay or neuter. Um, it, it can be very important with the ones who are spayed young as well, but particularly for those ones that are older and we basically change their entire endocrine system overnight, um, a lot of them will become hypothyroid within six to 12 months. So definitely monitor that. And what you may see, they may just fall off the charts and be very low, or you may see when you're doing it every six months that you're getting this slow decline until you finally get to that point where it's like, oh, going to have to supplement with thyroid medication. So definitely want to support that. Um, so from a Chinese medicine standpoint, um, for, we talked about this a little bit with our crypt orchid dogs where we're trying to get the testicle or, or cats, where we're trying to get the testicle to come down. We use an herb called epimedium, which is basically a jing tonic. Um, it's a life essence. So things that support the life essence can also support <clears throat> these animals where we basically ripped out their life essence. So epimedium, if they're struggling um, with some of the problems that can occur, uh, with these big changes in their endocrine system can be helpful. So you could use that for six to 12 months. And interestingly, uh, deer antler velvet, which has been used in Chinese medicine for thousands of years, um, contains multiple hormones. It contains female sex hormones, estrone and estradiol, and the male sex hormones, including testosterone, androstenedione, and dehydroepiandosterone. Um, research in rats using deer antler velvet suggests the substance may have an androgen-like effect, and it contains substances that helps cells grow and function. So deer antler velvet is the active component in our uh, wellness and senior formulas. So they both have deer antler velvet along with the green lip muscle. Um, the wellness formula also has colostrum in it, which is something else that we're going to talk about. Um, so that supports joints as well. If you want just deer antler velvet for its effects, you can use the life formula. And that's actually uh, labeled for human use. Uh, certainly fine for use in dogs as well, uh, particularly the larger breed dogs, 50 pounds and up, this is a great product for them. And the, the deer antler velvet is literally just supporting that um, hormone function that we've lost. Okay. So, um, uh, so for nutritional support, things like fermented uh, raw goat or cow milk, kelp, bone marrow, um, small fish from the sea, like sardines and mackerel, eggs, bee pollen, all of those things are gin tonics that are going to support that life essence. And certainly you could add colostrum in the form of goat milk colostrum or cow milk colostrum. We have two different ones on the website. Um, so I would recommend doing that as well to support their immune system. Um, we can do hormone restoration therapy, and there's a couple of different um, 
uh, options available for the males. There is a product called Dogosterone, and some veterinarians are learning how to do this procedure. It's actually an injectable um, Dogosterone. And um, so if you have animals who are struggling with hind end weakness or um, hind end mobility issues, uh, muscle wasting, that sort of thing, the dogosterone has become fairly popular for that, particularly, I, I think, in some of these pediatric uh, neuters. Um, later in life, we, we see a lot of things start to fall apart. So um, we are looking at that sort of hormone therapy. And for years, for incontinence, in particularly in females, um, low doses of estrogen have been used. You have to be very, very careful when supplementing estrogen. The doses have to be very low. Otherwise, you can cause an irreversible bone marrow suppression. Um, so that's something you would work with your veterinarian to do. Um, but there's there's not a ton of research on hormone replacement, but there was a study published in 2021, and it focused on a four-year-old dog who was suffering from progressive, and this is a four-year-old, progressive reduced mobility, rapid weight gain, and fear of unfamiliar people following a pediatric neuter. Now, I would definitely be testing this dog for all of his endocrine stuff. I would be looking at his adrenal gland function. I would be looking at his thyroid function because any... Um, fall in the function of any of those glands could cause these symptoms that they were seeing. Um, so they started weekly testosterone shots on this dog, followed by gonadotropin releasing hormone uh, after he'd been on the testosterone for three months. And the dog showed significant improvement in mobility. His fear and anxiety were uh, decreased. And he's continuing to see receive hormone treatment and his health is monitored through standard blood work, testosterone levels, and regular prostate exams. Um, but we need more research to determine whether this is something that could be um, used more widely for our pets. Um, so we know that uh, when we remove gonads, particularly from our dogs, we're going to see problems that we discussed on Monday and Tuesday of this week. Uh, those blogs are available on the website. So we have a blog that goes along with each of the, th the topics that we discussed this week, the male dog sterilization options, female dog sterilization options. Um, Wednesday, we talked about different anomalies, including cryptorchidism, and that is a fairly common problem. Um, Thursday, we talked about kitty cat spay and neuter and went through some stats on that. And then today, how to support your animals if they have been spayed or neutered. And um, so that blog is available as well with the information that I just talked about. So keep your animals safe, keep your animals healthy. Monday, we're going to talk about how to deal with rescue. A little tricky, a little tricky. I don't know that I have a great solution for you, but I'll give you the options that I've used in the past. <laughs>